Thank you, Jeffrey, for such a generous and thoughtful introduction. Thank you, Aaron, for the music, which was amazing. And my apologies for having got the time of the reading wrong. It's lovely to be here. Um, yes, Coles Hill is the place where I live, so it's also a place in my mind, I guess. And the first poem I'm going to read you is a poem about um, my brother. I have a brother I didn't grow up with, and the result of that is that we're quite awkward when we meet each other, but we want to meet each other. So what do we do? We resolve it by going for a walk. This is called The Corn Versicles. I'm going to move this down a tiny bit, actually. The Corn Versicles. I love paths cut through corn, through grass and meadow sweet, that clean opening, as if the path were a pattern for life, abstract and true, as a form or a truth about you. And I love to walk the new swathes where stalks start up from the exact gold dark as I reach down to touch each corn head with a fingertip. It makes me think of Helena, Empress Mother of Constantine, gambling on the natural justice that gods reward faithfulness. Everything good still waits in the next field. The best is yet to come, and it smells of warm earth, praised by sun, of seed heads husked against my thumb. Do you remember when we walked at East Leach? Did you see me stoop and grow strange to myself, like the rows of wheat, like shaking bells of husk? It was a guided tour going on. Perhaps we should invite them to join us. I grew up by the Atlantic um, on the west coast of Wales and we went back for a weekend recently. This is a little poem called Ha, you know, sea mist, Ha. The cloud bank is not Atlantis, but water moving over the face of water, softening the western sea. Blue feathers the blue. You'd think the sky felt some tenderness for this meniscus mirroring it all morning. It's not the landmass, but the going there you dream about. The cutting across blue, scissors through silk. I used to work in a London office, well I suppose I still do, and I used to find I was driving home to Coles Hill quite late at night quite often. The thing about night driving is um, the roadkill, particularly at this time of year when they're all rushing about and desperate to feed their young or do other things and you know their road sense, safety sense goes. And it's really hard to write a roadkill poem <coughs> after Ted Hughes. But anyway, this one's mine, and it's called Orphic. Orphic. The vixen was a silhouette. In the milk, perhaps in whelp, she trod and trod. Her mistake was forming like shadow in the muscle. At night, each thing smells sweet and full of signals. The verge plants are coarsely drawn with ink. Propped akimbo, the soiled fox seems to mouth some vast affront, her head thrown back, all jaw, a long bone made to resonate, a pleated bone made to string, then pluck, the way a wheel is strung from its rim. <coughs> Another little thing poem, Pillows. 
Who are these sleepers afloat in their white beds, seeming so fearless and absent? Who are these angels breathing in the silence, breathing out consolation? And another bedtime poem is The Art of Few. <laughs> I smuggled this poem into Coles Hill, which was a commissioned book. It wasn't actually my choice to write a book about the village. In fact, I found it really hard to do because I found when I tried to write about the people, you know, my neighbours and my friends, that everything turned out too sweet. I wanted to resolve everything. Um, I think a poem needs, you know, a chip of ice at its heart. And uh, so there aren't very many people in this book. Um, and some of the people are fictional, including sort of this person. But anyway, I smuggled it in because there's a green in the poem, but the green is actually Shepherd's Bush Green, and it's really a poem about uh, living half my life in London and the attractions of that life. So it's called The Art of Fugue. A curtain brims. Its white lip appears dashing and slovenly, like the girl on the tube with her bedroom hair. I miss that girl, crossing the green in heels and feather trim, whom I so nearly and never was. Oh, waking is a rising to light. Something humming deep and dirty moves through a suspended life. In the dawning bedroom, the jacket on a chair back is a gesture suddenly stilled, and the girl, <coughs> crossing the green, turns her head on a pillow, barred with light. There's something very attractive, it seems to me, about the way poems allow you to be um, a little bit irresponsible and be in more than one place at once, which obviously is what that poem is about. And, um, this is another poem that does something related to that um, through time. Um, I'm afraid this is a this really happened poem, but I hope it's, I hope it's mystified itself enough to redeem that fact. And it's called Galley's Ball. Galley was a dog. Actually, Galley was an overwhelming Labrador who used, when I was six, to leap up and push me over and lick me in the face. And I didn't like Galley at the time, but now I think Galley was probably a really attractive dog. Galley's ball. Unceasingly, never lost, as the papers say, the grass beyond the schoolyard nettings, reedy when Mandy and Janet huddle at the fence telling secrets. Their breath is hot and forceful. The day forever itself, while in a Devon churchyard the damp curls your hair under a veil, still slipping, crooked from the photos that later and already crowd the wedding album, for you are marrying again and again, the same mistake always marring your life, which goes on turning into itself, returning to itself, even Today you wait inside the child who plays at swinging higher, higher in the farm's walled garden beyond the ruined yard, which all your life you'd wish you weren't just visiting, where the retriever galley carries in miniature the lurcher snoring under your kitchen table. You hear galley's barks rising and falling, falling and rising as he leaps for the ball, Juliet has thrown for him, her arm still behind her head to throw the ball, still describing its long arc through sunlight as your feet push off from cloud and you glide over the yard with its clustered roofs, its immortal swallows, its children who throw on office coats and leave for work calling goodbye and calling hello somewhere I don't know where, they too are not lost.
Geoffrey very kindly mentioned my bee poems, and I'm going to read those to you. This is another cheat for Colso, because these were a commission, um, one of those lovely commissions where you're asked to write about something which is so juicy and so full of symbol and resonance and experience that you have something to say or something to explore. And, um, uh, you know, it was one of those, it's trendy to write about bees because of colony collapse disorder commissions. Um, but the village I live in is a national trust village and uh, the trust are not brilliant landlords, but they have great ideas about the village and how it should be a green village. So they're always having initiatives like a community orchard. And one of their initiatives was that we should all keep bees. There are 200 of us. We should all keep bees. So at year one, they ran skep building workshops. And about a dozen people went and built skeps. Year two was keeping bees. Only one person <coughs> keeps bees. And her name is Polly. So these are songs for Paul's bees, but in fact, the first bees are in London, the third bees are Islamic, the fourth bees are in Slovenia, and the last bees are in Colsa. Songs for Paul's bees. Swarm. Very deep, very mobile, the swarm song sounds in my chest. Not a beat. Not breath, but an older music, remembered, as a head turns on a pillow or hips lift. One gesture becoming another in the room when a shoulder moves close, then moves away, uncovering a picture window filled with blossom streaks, pale trailers that might be rain or jet trails, but these are flowers swarming, white and eager on dark branches, while the air bus overhead shakes the glass. Bee song. The song rises from long grass to make a mouth between the trees, rising and opening as if it will never be done. Opens its dark mouth breathing and rising, sound filling the space of sound, mostly secret, most necessary, trembling and calling itself out of the dark ceaselessness of itself, unendingly reforming dark in the dark and clearing between the maze headlands and the trees with the evening gathering in the long grass. Be summer. If God were limitless geometry, the perfection world reaches clumsily over itself to articulate. If he could be glimpsed in the pattern of limitless addition, but were not that pattern, beautiful though the turquoises and greens of the glazed tiles are, so <coughs> Beautiful that the eye swoons, dropping through endless form. If God were neither principle nor dream, resting his cheek on the earth for a moment, you might have imagined a gift of pure grace from a perfection that is bodiless here and everywhere. Bees could be his servants and prophets demonstrating beauty is a kind of humility, as tonight they offer no more than the hive's aroma. The cast in August, the cast is the limestone wine-growing region of Western Slovenia that limestone is named for. Bee boards bleach in the couch grass on high fields. And no one goes there. No one takes the steep goat tracks past ruined farms. I remember the secret you told me and how the abandoned hulls turn nailed flanks to the sun and sink in a murmur of bees, bees flecking the air brightly. Their hum is a rumor, 
an old chin. Winter bees. Every year, the weak January sun brings bumblebees nudging and thudding against the wood of my work shed, which must give out some old pine sweetness, soft in the grain, under the blue cracked paint, a blue miracle sky. Banal, but it moves us, a small spring resurrection in the time just before spring. What tender precision directs each bee to this recurring conversation, this compass set by the sun's contracted arc. The bee Christ wears his gilded crown of mourning for the station of the winter swarm. Out of strength came forth sweetness. Our dark hearts are hives. Actually, I do usually read a sonnet that Geoffrey quoted from, so I'll read you that <laughs> conception. I'm afraid this is another this really happened, Brian, because I, um, I have a writing shed, not a posh one. <coughs> sonnet, conception. The small cat inside the hut, looking out of the door's glass at the dog scratching that door, places her paws together with unconscious care on the blue square of the mat. Grace is a secret clockwork, she seems to say, which is true. We'll never arrive at that truth. I mean, we can never undress right down to how we were in our conception's new caress when the membrane spilled the dreaming yolk, when self first broke and entered self. Sometimes I get to work with composers and um, a long time ago I was commissioned to write a set of poems to be set by Sally Beamish for singer and quartet. And she had them for about three, four years, and then suddenly at a week's notice she said, listen, there aren't enough words here for 15 minutes of music, I need two more poems. And I'm really bad at writing quickly. So here's one of the poems that I produced, it's called Apples. My trees are troubled by a wind that blows from the heart of each. A troubled wind, speaking the word loss, taking a breath to speak the word again, loss, as if it were the only word, oh, the swaying heartwood. <coughs> Hugo Williams used to, he still occasionally does, he used to write a column. He writes a column occasionally in the TLS that used to be very funny, called Freelance. And it was very funny because Hugo is a great pro stylist, but also because you get asked to do weird things as a freelancer. And um, one of the weird but in ultimately very moving things I got asked to do was, I thought, was to teach a poetry course to um, the Anglican clergy of the Diocese of St. Asaph's in North Wales at St. Binos, which is the Catholic seminary, uh, where Jeremiah Hopkins you know, wrote so amazingly, and which is indeed beautiful, it's in a beautiful place. However, when I got there, I discovered it was a retreat. And I always glibly say, oh, I'm a post-Christian poet. I'm still dealing with the God-shaped hole. I have this Christian iconography. Suddenly, I was face to face with participation, not least, in that we sort of had to, had to say, take turns leading the mass. So, um, it made me think about a lot of things. Um, one of the clergy there was really keen on bell ringing, and so I wrote a poem called The Changes, 
where you know it's not as beautiful and rich as actually bell ringing where you have more bells in a peal but you know the change the number the the bit that changes moves down through the sequence so this sort of does that in its limited way and because i really like it i'm going to read you the entry from the felster database appeals for colesville which is actually true i haven't made it up it's utterly mysterious to me and it goes grandsire doubles 25th of february 1939 doubles nine methods 5th of June, 1991. Surprise minor, seven methods, 4th of November, 2002. Spliced minor, 14 methods, 20th of February, 2011. There's, there are two words from Jeremiah Hopkins here, elected silence. The changes. Water is plasma. Shuddering in combination. The grass shudders. The bluebells are a shuddering haze. And your blood is honey. It stays in the mouth like guilt, rumour, grief. A necessary meal. I'm afraid of the untouched body. Silence. The priest waiting in the garden. Your blood is honey. It fills the mouth like guilt, rumour, grief. A necessary meal. But what's nearer or more real than the sweetness in the vein, that sticky dew? Will the freshet in the cup rinse away the taste of lamb and salt, oil and rosemary? Elected silence stirs. As if to say, before you were, I am. Local, huge, it's full of the milkiness of wings, rain light, the susuration of hungers. Your blood is honey, stays in the mouth like guilt, shame, grief, those necessary meals. Once again, the prayer room with its milky light, its private, pragmatic silence. Your blood is honey. It stays in the mouth like guilt, rumour, grief. Their sweet and salt is to be eaten here, among red armchairs, in the odour of new carpet. To be eaten now. Is it right to be the lamb who must trust the shepherd, which is to say, death. Your blood is honey. The priest smokes a cigarette among the shadows in the silent garden, lives of the saints under his arm. Guilt, rumour, grief. Look how they break from the vein into the surgeon's cup. Whenever I start to read that poem, if I haven't remembered to say it beforehand, I start to smile because the thing about your blood is honey came from the fact the wine they picked up from the supermarket on when it was dessert wine. So it was very sweet and it was the wrong colour. In other words, it wasn't red like blood. None of you are smiling, but <laughs> it seems to me absolutely hilarious. <laughs> I think it was this sweet yellow wine. But there we are. Um, I think we've hit a not very cheerful passage here. Um, I'm going to read you what is, in fact, a Manchester poem. Uh, you will know that there have been scandals about um, the music school, about Cheatham's. And um, I knew extremely well the woman who, um, who killed herself during the first abuse trial. She, we were sort of, she was my alter ego in the days when I was a violinist. We were born at the same time, we shared the same initials, a lot, a lot of other things too. And we hated each other, therefore. So, I have a lot of... Um, if I thought I had conflicted feelings about going on a retreat with the Anglican clergy, I have a lot more. 
things to think about about Francis Andrade. So this is called Fran. A face like her own in the darkened window. Night where the eyes should be. She touches the glass. It too is damp and cold. She smells the salt. Her breast in the stranger's hand is the colour of salt cod. A pulse throbs at her neck. Her colour rises and rises, the blood unstoppable. Blood underlines the cut approvingly. Out of fleshy pallor, this scribbled response. She smells the salt, as if the smell of her conception was still on her. In the darkness, in bed at night, hilarity switches tracks, comes swerving back, lights blazing. White socks and Chinese skipping. Under the school uniform, she hides a tiny grown woman, a poppet. Sparkle, Francis, sparkle. Her sparkle comes out staring and wide-eyed. In the modernist forest, a girl child wanders, searching for an old fairy tale. Little Vixen, with her hot breath and cunning. She smells of salt, as if preserving cold salt spray, the cold of her birthplace. No one can hear the thrum, thrum of her heart. No one hears it pause. The human body is a heavy machine. Such stillness when the motor shudders and stops. I'll do one poem from Rough Music. And then I can't finish. I think this is a poem which prefigures Colesville. This was another commission. The Tate uh, have, or used to have a poem of the month, and I didn't, as usual, have a lot of time to write this poem. So <coughs> I thought, well, I'll write about Stanley Spencer because I think he's absolutely amazing, and resurrection in Cookham Churchyard is completely bound to be on display at the moment, so fine. Something that's already kind of not in my memory bank, although that, but, you know, already part of my kind of symbolic world. So I wrote the poem and then I discovered that it's not on display anywhere. Great British Press War masterpiece, it's in the stacks, or well, it was at the time anyway. This poem is called Angels and Dirt because Stanley Spencer said, I'm on the side of angels and dirt. And also rather neat because it was commissioned by a woman called Angel de Hook. Angels and Dirt. Bodies the colour of earth clay clagged or rosy pale as house brick, the broad-armed locals wrestle up. Look, they're everywhere in the stone garden, rising like hollyhocks, like fresh loaves leavening. Here's Dennis and Paul, all neighbourly beauty. And here you are, as if for the first time, setting out bread and salt on the marble. It was no struggle, you say, this second birth, swimming up through soil which crumbles where you cram, <coughs> dust from dust, but a yearning, almost like love. And now the inevitable war poem, um, which is related to that poem. For 12 years, I was um, 
involved with someone who for 11 of those 12 years had a terminal diagnosis um, because uh, when we bombed former Yugoslavia, we NATO, we used depleted uranium as ballast and um, the result is that there are soft tissue cancer clusters around wherever we bombed, so some around Novi Sad, some in Skopje because the capital of Macedonia is in a basin, so although we bombed around Tetovo, you know, the water brings it down into Skopje. So he had one of these. And being from Macedonia, he's quite brown. Hawthorne milk. Uh, you know that superstition that to bring Hawthorne into the house is to bring death into the house. <coughs> Hawthorne milk. Thorn lily runs beside the fields to meet the sky where the smell of rainwater and salt is like an opening. Chalice or drain, the mouth soft and wet. This smell is meat, not hawthorn, the animal that turns and turns nearby is not the sea. You were a breast where I drank rusty milk that made me yours. The rust peeled from your hands and stained my skin like ochre, like blood. When you died, my skin turned black. When we danced the macabre, your skin turned white as the flowers of a northern spring, and I was your milk hope. The taste of blood in milk is like rust. The smell of death is like hawthorn blossom. Hawthorn stars the sky, black against daylight. Its odour is close and creaturely at night. How is it drugs can give the skin this deathly perfume of hawthorn? Familiar dark head crowned with bright hawthorn. Your fear is so lightly, <coughs> so darkly warm. And they're going to finish with a sonnet. Which also really happened. That's to say, when the National Trust's plumbing expert came round, because I had juddering pipes, he really did say this. Tremor. The metals of the pipes do not agree, and iron is the sacrificial anode is what the landlord's plumbing expert said when he called the day. And here comes a host of small exchanges, as if from the electric world. Pulses, tremors of antimony, tremors under your skin at night. Something is adjusting, or anyway, changing. Iron pipes and copper pipes at war. A high-pitched shiver thrills the plumbing. The house, the whole world is shaking. If you're not dead, you're doing all right. Thank you.